two o'clock. Uh, um, I think actually we can start, dear colleagues, because we have a packed uh, agenda today ahead of us. Very interesting. So again, good morning and good afternoon, evening, wherever you are joining us from today. And welcome to today's webinar on the call to action for human rights and what are the links to the humanitarian program cycle, especially focusing on the aspects linked to analysis. And this is a very important topic for all of us practitioners, I would say, because as you know, the call to action has been launched just two years ago. We will celebrate in February its second anniversary and it has created a momentum a momentum for all of us, for UN entities, but also for NGOs, protection clusters, for the system as a whole to advance on the front of human rights and move forward collectively. And this is why we are here today. Uh, we are here to discuss what it means in practice, how we can go about it. We will hear several examples from different regions, continents and I believe it will be quite inspirational for all of us where we can take it and how we can advance in regards to implementation of the Secretary General's call to action for human rights and the links to humanitarian uh, uh, programming and analysis. I'm also very pleased uh, actually to share with you that this is not a standalone initiative. Along with the Global Protection Cluster Information Working Group, we are planning to have a series of events uh, around the Secretary General's call to action uh, for human rights. And this is the first uh, one of um, this series. And you may be wondering why have we chosen to focus on analysis or the links with the humanitarian program cycle? And there is a practical reason for that, because in the last few months we have been receiving from you questions from the field asking, OK, now we are going through the HNOs, HRPs, through uh, PATH and other analysis exercise. What does it mean for us? How do we apply, apply the call to action throughout those processes? So uh, I hope some of you or maybe most of you have seen also the two pager we have published a few weeks ago and I would like to ask my colleague Peter if you can please post a link to it in the chat where we have tried very briefly to make the connections for you between the call to action uh, for human rights, humanitarian program cycle related processes with specific focus on analysis. So you can look forward to other events that will be coming your way in the upcoming weeks and months. But um, I believe already today we have a very interesting agenda ahead of us, a program. But before I will uh, present you who are our today's panelists, I would like to give the floor to our dear colleague Dina Abusambra from OCHA to share with us uh, her insight and perspectives, why this discussion is important from OCHA's perspective and why it goes even beyond entities and protection clusters. So over to you, Dina, please. Thank you, Valerie. Um, I just also want to join you in welcoming the panel and everyone else um, online in today's exchange. It's exciting to see um, everyone's introductions from many different parts of the world. Um, I wanted to share just a few brief observations by way of introduction to frame our discussion. So first, um, just to note that the discussion today will showcase some examples of how the protection cluster is more systematically using human rights analysis and information as part of our overall protection analysis, but also in, you know, within the human uh, humanitarian program cycle processes. But as Valerie has noted, this will be the first in a series of webinars on the topic, and we do hope um, to hold a future event um, to also focus on uh, other sector perspectives and bringing in other actors as well. In the meantime, there may be some other um, cluster colleagues online today, and we would encourage you um, to share inputs during the question and answer exchange after the panel. Um, related to this, I just wanted to underline that the Humanitarian Program Cycle 2022 Facilitation Package 
which many of you may be aware of and have tried to um, unpack because it's a huge thing. Um, but it does highlight um, the call to action as a key reference um, point for needs assessment and response uh, planning. And this obviously goes beyond the protection cluster. It points to the responsibility of all sectors to ensure that the rights of persons affected by an armed conflict or disaster are taken into account in needs assessment and in turn addressed also in the overall humanitarian response. Um, in this regard, the call to action really provides an opportunity for all of us to reinforce our collective assessments, analysis, planning and monitoring, as well as the partners involved in all of these processes. And today we'll hear some ideas from uh, for practically how this can work from a couple of contexts, including uh, through closer collaboration and drawing on the expertise of human rights advisors and OHCHR presences, um, by way of increased engagement with human rights organizations and mechanisms, which allow us to benefit from the often detailed monitoring and reporting on human rights violations and robust information and recommendations that they produce, by drawing on and incorporating human rights analysis tools and approaches in our assessment and analysis frameworks. And lastly, I think it's worth pointing um, to um, you know, having more robust human rights analysis also provides a crucial basis for us to establish uh, stronger links and influence the agendas and planning frameworks of other key actors and um, obviously development and, and peace um, actors in particular. So just in closing, I don't want to take more time. I just wanted to leave you with a key question that we do want to explore with you today, which is, um, you know, I, I've been trying to think of it. I think in some way, it's, you know, how can we be more intentional in incorporating uh, human rights into our processes, approaches and in our partnerships? So with that, I will just hand back to Valerie and to our panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dina, for those reflections. Uh, and also, I really like what you just said. How can we be more intentional? about the human rights approach and uh, uh, how do we weave it more strategically and systematically into our work. So I would say this is the chapeau of our event today. And with that, um, uh, colleagues, maybe very briefly on the ground rules, you know them very well as usual. Uh, we have together about an hour and a half. So after the panel, we will have a space to exchange. So please use the chat function to post your questions. We will be recording this webinar for those who cannot join. Uh, if you can remain on mute, if you would like to intervene, you can raise your hand and uh, you can be sharing your examples, questions throughout uh, the event. So even as of now, if you have any reflections, questions, you, we will be monitoring it continuously. Very good. So I have the pleasure now to share with you who are our panelists uh, today and you see them also on the screen. We will start uh, with an opening and presentation by Sveta Madhuri Kanan, who is uh, working in the executive office of the Secretary General and who will share with us some insight on the call to action and links to humanitarian interventions to frame our discussion. After that, we will have a chance to hear from colleagues in the field as you can see, a very nice variety of uh, operations. Firstly, from Kathleen Gerstschlund, who is the Protection Cluster Coordinator, West Bank, and will share with us some insight and experience from the OPT Protection Cluster. And then we will shift to the whole of Syria response. And uh, we are lucky to have two colleagues who will share with us uh, their uh, experience and good practices. First of all, Samir Saran, the Protection Cluster co-lead for Whole of Syria response, but also Elsa Le Penek, who is the Human Rights Advisor covering the Whole of Syria response. So complementing views and perspective and the collaboration uh, on human rights aspects uh, and in relation to today's topic. Following to that, we will fly to another continent, to Americas, and hear from the Protection Cluster Coordinator in Colombia, from Juan Sebastián Díaz-Parra, 
so welcome, uh, Sebastian. And finally, uh, we will land in Mozambique, uh, hearing from Hugo Reichenberg on um, the experience of Mozambique Protection Cluster in uh, their initiatives around human rights analysis and working with human rights actors. So very rich uh, discussion indeed and insights that we will hear now from the distinguished panelists. Uh, as I mentioned, get ready with your questions. We will then open up uh, the space uh, to hear from you and get some feedback and uh, ideas inside back from panelists. So thank you very much. I will not take more of the time and will directly invite uh, Sveta please to come in and to share with us her uh, remarks and uh, thoughts on the call to action in a humanitarian setting. So over to you Sveta, please. <laughs> Thanks so much, Valerie, now that we've managed to unmute. Um, thank you so much for this initiative and for this series. I think um, from coming from the Call to Action core team, we really appreciate your enthusiasm and the GPC's um, support and engagement in thinking through how the Call to Action as sort of a system-wide overarching umbrella really can be applicable to various different contexts, specifically in the in the humanitarian space and how it is that you can concretely tie it to your programming, because I think that's where the, the rubber hits the road. Um, so thank you very much for organizing this. I realize that we've got a little bit of a mixed uh, group. I think some of you might have heard this before, but I think I'll, I'll just go over the basics just so um, that everybody's clear on what we're talking about. Next slide, please. So this is a very busy slide and I apologize for that, but the Secretary General's um, initiative on the call to action for human rights is really the flagship initiative on human rights. And it's sort of the umbrella that the Secretary General uses to kind of speak about human rights and make sure that human rights is really at the center of the entire UN response. The initiative builds um, logically and substantively on uh, human rights up front and kind of takes it a little bit further in the sense that the call to action very clearly sets out these seven thematic areas, but the purpose behind sort of looking at these various issues such as sustainable development, rights in times of crisis, which obviously is particularly relevant to what we're talking about today, but also gender and sort of climate justice issues, is to really underscore the message that human rights are applicable to contemporary challenges and to kind of offer a little bit of a framework for the UN system to come together to come together and to think about what that concretely means for us. So what we've been trying to do from the executive office of the Secretary General, we've been work, working very closely with OHCHR, who's part of our um, core team, to kind of think a little bit and to work with the system to develop tools and ways in which um, at the sort of at the system global level, at the entity level and at the field level, we can start integrating human rights much more uh, consciously in the work that we do. And I think in the humanitarian space, I was thinking about this a little bit because we've got this sophisticated system that has been built around protection. I think this is the, there's a much more natural fit than perhaps in some of the other pillars and other areas of engagement that we've um, seen. So I think much of what I'm going to be talking about today and what you will see in the slides will, will make a lot of sense to you. Um, what we've been trying to do um, at the um, at the headquarters level is to kind of try and um, put in motion a quite a broad brush engagement with our seas across the globe to start to initiate to have country level dialogues. And I think these country level dialogues are really meant to be an opening or an entry point for the RC to convene the entire UN presence on the ground um, and to really use it as an opportunity to kind of identify the top three to five human rights challenges and to have almost like a joined up response to these. So really create the basis for joined up analysis and joined up problem solving. Now, this in the first instance is a little bit of an inward 
perspective. So the idea is really to kind of get the UN system uh, to sit around the table and to talk about these issues. But of course, there is a very important role that partners um, play in all of this. And I think this is something that we've been trying to encourage our C's as well, is that as they're having these conversations to also think about where it is that they can bring in civil society partners and others. And I think that the the GPC and the Human Rights Task Team, the setup that you have here is really excellent because you've already got that sort of joined up integrated structure to think about some of these issues. So this is a little bit one of the priorities that we've been working on this past year. Um, we haven't, I mean, we're still in the process of really rolling out these country level dialogues. And I think if there's one thing that you take away from today is really to say, well, actually, there is an opportunity for you to also have that discussion with your RC and to put a little bit, pre little bit of pressure on your RC to make sure that this is something that happens. There was a, a secretary general um, level, sort of principles level discussion in the context of the executive committee, which is one of the um, highest decision making uh, bodies within the UN. Um, and a very clear instruction was sent last summer to everybody and to, to all of the senior leaders in the field that these country level dialogues weren't optional. So I think you have an opportunity here to really um, push for these and to use these as an entry point as you're thinking about your HNO programming and HRP programming um, to use this almost as like an entry point for identifying sort of the top three to five cross cutting issues that you can then sort of think about how it is that you integrate them into your own programming. Um, next slide, please. So this is just <laughs> this is just a little bit of a, of a schema of how we've been thinking about making human rights a much more automatic part of our work. And I think this really goes into making sure that various agencies and entities that don't necessarily traditionally think of themselves as having a human rights mandate start to think about using as an analytical framework and as a as a way of kind of framing their their own work and their own um, engagement. So as you can see here, what we've been trying to do is, um, you know, we set up a little bit of an internal structure, which brings together um, 35 UN entities from across the system uh, in an interagency working group and who, like Valerie, who's our focal point for UNHCR, um, help us think through concretely what some of the tools would be that would be useful for colleagues in the field, such as yourselves, um, to kind of help translate the principles and the values of the common um, the call to action into something quite concrete. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we've been doing for these country level dialogues is that we've set up, you know, guidance. There's always guidance, um, but we've also prepared um, a set of questions that we hope would help frame some of these conversations and that we hope would also move the conversations within the UNCT towards more of a thematic cross cutting analysis. Um, and away a little bit from, from the usual speaking about mandate specific issues. Because one of the things that we've noticed in the initial um, country level dialogues that we've been holding or that we've been supporting um, is that of course there is a tendency within the system to kind of come to the table with you know standard talking points of like who are the vulnerable people, what are their vulnerabilities and what is the programming that various entities are already doing. And I think the idea really behind the call to action and sort of the this notion of a transformational vision is to kind of go beyond our mandates to start thinking in a much more joined up manner. Um, next, so here you will see in the next four slides are a few cross cutting big picture questions that I think, I mean, of course, I was looking at the um, the HPC, um, the package, the support package that Dina was talking about earlier. And of course, you've got various levels of analysis that are already built into this. I think we're very conscious of not wanting to add to your, uh, the, you know, the, the extensive work that you're already doing around the various sort of uh, planning and programming cycles, but perhaps rather to think about these questions as allowing you to take a little bit of a step back and to think strategically about some of the larger, bigger picture issues that you are all collectively trying to tackle and then to kind of use some of these questions a little bit as a as an overarching frame. Next slide, please. 
In fact, I think we can skip through these because, as Valerie said, we'll make these slides available to all of you so you can go into them and very much feel free to, to reach out if you have any questions around these. Next slide, please. And I think this is actually an important part, the partnership. So I, the way that we've been thinking about is, is of course, to sort of think about the the substance of it, right? So where is it that there are these big challenges? Where is it that the UNCT, the gaps really in, in where the UNCT has not been responding, but then also to be much more strategic about the types of partnerships that we're engaging with. And I know that the um, Human Rights Task Team, you've also been doing work with national human rights institutions and sort of making those links. And I think that this is a, I mean, Obviously, I don't have to tell you this within humanitarian responses. I think the work with local actors is, is a much more natural engagement that is already very strong. But I think particularly as we think about um, the types of issues that we're confronting, really thinking about some of the local human rights actors that you might be might want to reach out to um, and might want to sort of strategically engage in your processes, I think would be a very excellent first step and that's certainly something that we're encouraging really at the at the system-wide level also to do. Next slide please. <laughs> now this is of course always the key question what kind of resources are available to support us with all of this? I unfortunately have to say that um, there's no additional funding at this stage that we can make available for for the country level dialogues. Um, and that is, of course, I do understand it is a it is a challenge given that there is such a scarcity of of resources and capacities across. But I suppose the way that we've been trying to think uh, and and also offer up the call to action is really as a tool that would hopefully make all of your work easier by kind of connecting the dots between the different pieces that you're already engaging on. Um, next slide, please. Now, Valerie also asked me to speak about the Agenda for Protection, um, which is a particular piece of work that happens under the Rights in Times of Crisis um, area of focus on, of the call to action. So the Secretary General had proposed back in February 2020 that an Agenda for Protection be developed, which really is meant to offer up a bit of a policy framework um, that would bring together the entire UN system when it comes to protection issues. Now, this is not meant to sort of redefine what protection is, but it's meant to kind of offer up a bit of a common understanding of what we mean by protection. And in this particular case, um, ensuring that people's human rights are being protected um, and then to kind of offer up ways in which the peace and security and the humanitarian and the development and the human rights pillar can kind of come together on these issues. And I think Obviously, the gaps in our responses are quite clear, but I think one of the um, things that we're trying to look at is really sort of in, in situations of transition where there are handovers either within the system from one part of the, from one type of UN presence to another type of UN presence, um, from a UN presence back to the national government, um, and these sorts of sort of trickier situations to really think through practically what would be helpful um, for people to have. So the idea of this agenda for protection is to kind of set out, I think <laughs> at this stage, we, we still need to get full clearance on this, but sort of common uh, protection principles and to then de develop a bit of an operational plan that would give you pointers um, and that would really commit the entire system to um, setting in motion sort of um, mechanisms that would allow for protection to be much more at the forefront of the entire system. So whether that be annual principal level discussions on protection that would then kind of be backed up by regional level conversations that would be backed up by uh, country level um, discussions and active engagement of the government and other relevant parties. Um, and these types of things that I think are already happening a lot in the humanitarian space, but not so much in the in the other pillars. So really joining those um, dots up. Thanks. Fantastic, Sweta. I don't know how you managed, but you gave us a very clear picture of the call to action and even added the agenda for protection. Um, and 
what I feel from your presentation is really we have a clear link here to uh, the work of colleagues in the field. Uh, we heard that they are now country level consultations that ha are starting. Uh, we have heard the guiding questions that could provide us some, uh, I would say, hints or um, ideas where the discussions could be going and what you said I think it's very important here we go beyond our mm, you know box our entity uh, so we open up to the system-wide change hopefully how we can advance together and it's an opportunity as you mentioned Sveta uh, uh, to advance on protection related topics and uh, take this momentum uh, to advantage uh, of the affected population. So thank you so much. Colleagues, you have in the chat um, the link to the call to action as well uh, website, and you can keep thinking about further questions to Sweta, uh, who so nicely framed for us uh, this discussion. So thank you again. And now we can move to the field level experience or some examples, good practices that are already emerging on the links between the call to action um, and uh, the humanitarian program cycle related processes and analysis. So I would like to invite uh, Kathleen uh, to share with us uh, some examples and good practices from OPT. So over to you, Kathleen, please. Perfect. Thanks so much, Valerie, uh, and thanks so much for also inviting us and giving us the opportunity to to speak at this uh, at this webinar. Um, it's it's great to have a sort of platform also to highlight some of the some of the practices uh, of the protection cluster in the occupied Palestinian territory. Um, just quickly to introduce myself, uh, my name is Katrina Schlund. I work for the OPT protection cluster um, based in Ramallah in the West Bank office. Uh, currently working remotely, but. Uh, um, I wanted to not go into too much detail in terms of the context uh, and work of the cluster, but of course happy to share more of this if, if, co if colleagues have a, have questions later on. Um, just wanted to quickly mention that of course we're operating both in Gaza and, and West Bank uh, and that the context in the OPT um, remains a protracted protection crisis. Uh, we have um, characterized by a sort of years of Israeli military occupation, lack of respect for IHL and human rights law, uh, and sort of recurring uh, escalations of, of hostilities. As identified in our 2022 uh, HNO, um, violations of international humanitarian uh, law and international rights law is sort of at the heart of the OPT crisis um, and so remains sort of the, the main driver of uh, the humanitarian and the protection needs, um, which of course is something that most offices is, uh, is familiar with. Um, if we can go to slide two, please. Uh, I'll just start by giving just an overview of what generally uh, has worked well in our office in terms of human rights integration, uh, and then just give a bit more details on, on some of the ways we approach, for example, the protection uh, analysis updates and the human term program cycle um, sort of outputs and, and processes. So one of the key elements uh, sort of first to highlight in, in terms of our, our sort of human rights integration has been, of course, our engagement uh, and close coordination with OHHR. Um, as you saw on the last slide, OHHR is, is, the, is the lead of the protection cluster in the OPT. Um, and so because we are an integrated office, we sort of naturally work uh, collectively and, and consistently together when it comes to analysis and addressing um, both protection and human rights challenges, um, which, which also involves sort of the, having more joined up uh, planning, work planning um, of, of the whole office. So, uh, so yeah, just to mention that we we basically we we draw up a lot of the information gathering and analysis which is done um, of the cluster, uh, particularly also uh, since many of the partners of the protection cluster, of course, are the same as OHHR uh, human rights partners um, and also the the OHHR capacity building team partners. Um, so, for example, when we collect data for for the mandated human rights reports or submitting shadow reports um, to various human rights mechanisms as OHHR that sort of links up directly with, with also our work as, uh, as lead of the protection cluster. Um, the OHHR office in the OPT has, uh, has sort of a very long standing uh, mandate to monitor and report on the human rights situation. Um, and so given this sort of close uh, and regular engagement uh, with the human rights uh, team, we are able to access sort of very reliable, clear 
uh, analysis and data on, on human rights violations, on trends uh, and on human rights obligations uh, and a legal analysis, which we use in a lot of our, our products and our also analysis for, for the protection sort of situation. Um, this includes receiving sort of situation reports on a regular basis um, of sort of latest developments and incidents being monitored also by OHHR. Um, so we have this sort of solid um, solid human rights analysis that we can that we can use. Um, in addition to this, I also just wanted to quickly mention that, uh, of course, due to the sort of special composition of the OHHR office, both as the sort of mandated uh, agency to report on human rights, as well as leading the protection cluster, um, this means that our coverage is quite wide. Uh, and so, for example, when we as protection cluster brief the humanitarian country team, um, this includes relaying both protection and human rights uh, information uh, and sort of key key messages and advocacy, uh, including in, in, in some of our information products. Um, other sort of areas of collaboration uh, with the human rights team um, include sort of field visits and, and referrals, for example. So when some of our protection cluster staff are going on field visits uh, to assess different situations and, and areas of experience and protection concerns, we will sometimes join up with the with human rights colleagues uh, from the OGHR office just to ensure more sort of efficient uh, engagement and, and, and visits and, and we'll share notes and assessments. Um, so naturally there again, we, we sort of combine the two areas of human rights and protection um, when, when we're reporting on, on, on assessments that done visits. Uh, and of course referrals includes the human rights monitors reaching out to us if they identify protection needs during their, their visits and vice versa. Um, so this is uh, this has worked really well and, and something that that's sort of um, is standard um, procedure in, in our in our office as a, as a joint uh, uh, office. Um, if we can go to slide three, uh, I just wanted to quickly say that uh, looking at sort of the HPC, um, since human rights violations are, are the key drivers of the humanitarian needs in the OPT, this is also very much at the forefront of the analysis that we do in the HNO. Um, which includes using, you know, information, data, and trends analysis again from also from our colleagues in OHHR. Um, this means that we continue to prioritize. We have sort of monitoring, documentation, and advocacy as a key eligible action in our HRP, uh, which includes a focus on monitoring and documenting violations of international human rights law, of course. Um, in addition to IHL conflict-related violence. Um, settlement related activities, uh, which is for specific to the OPT, um, protection issues affecting human rights defenders, uh, and also monitoring of, of grave human rights violations against children. So all of that is, is eligible, eligible activities under the protection cluster um, in the HRP. We also encourage um, partners to, to continue monitoring, and, and sort of this comes also from the analysis done in HNO, but to continue monitoring and reporting uh, aimed at reducing preventing human rights uh, violations related to COVID-19. Um, and of course, also that to, to have rights-based advocacy work um, orientated towards this sort of accountability and respect for uh, international uh, human rights law. Um, then just on uh, the next slide, um, to, to talk more a bit more of the protection analysis updates uh, that we have done so far. Uh, so we have so far published uh, one in October, which um, October last year, which focused mostly on the escalation uh, of violence, uh, which we saw in May 2021, particularly hostilities in, in Gaza. Uh, but of course, human rights analysis was, was again, a very integral part of that process uh, of developing that update. Um, in addition to having sort of assessment of the threats and impacts and capacities using secondary data from partners and assessments uh, and put some AORs. We also relied a lot on reporting uh, and analysis from OHHR when it came to sort of key data and figures uh, during the hostilities. Um, of course, for example, OHHR, OHHR tracks and verifies all fatalities during hostilities, for example, so we used a lot of their data um, and also specific elements uh, of their analysis of sort of the violations of, of IHL um, and human rights concerns, trends, uh, and human rights obligations of each of the of the actors involved. For our upcoming uh, protection analysis update, uh, we'll be focused on women and girls uh, protection issues. Uh, and again, we're using a lot of the human rights analysis that we that we, for example, did during an internal mapping um, on women's rights together with the OHHR office, uh, which we which we contributed to. So we're addressing sort of multiple areas of protection human rights concerns uh, for women and girls. Um, so there again, just to 
more specifically, we are including when we're sort of human rights context analysis of different power structures, uh, relevant national legal policy frameworks, uh, international rights obligations, of course, commitments, uh, as well as highlighting some of the sort of underlying root causes of gender equality. Um, so it's that will that will be also be sort of highlighted clearly. So as a last point, I also just want to mention the um, uh, that we're looking more into sort of information management systems to help support this analysis uh, and these updates. Um, and especially sort of the joint information analysis uh, with, with the human rights uh, organizations. Um, so for that, that includes uh, a protection information information management matrix, uh, which we've developed to sort of act as a, a repository um, to sort of collect and store secondary data, such as reports and surveys and assessments uh, and other forms of information across the different AORs that we work with, of course, but then also having a, a sort of specific dedicated section on research and studies that's published uh, specifically looking at the human rights uh, situation um, and a different analysis uh, released by partners and or GHR. Um I think that's that's all I wanted to just uh, quickly give an overview of. I know we have so much time, but uh, happy to, to answer any questions uh, during the Q&A. So that's that's it for me. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Katrin. This has been extremely interesting and uh, you gave us a lot of examples. I see that we have online a lot of uh, protection cluster coordinators, so I'm sure uh, this is quite inspiring. We know that the OPT situation is quite specific in terms of leadership, uh, uh, but you managed to leverage really an, uh, this partnership and to take advantage of it to uh, use fully the human rights frameworks and to take it forward. If possible, uh, Katrin, can you uh, post the links to the documents that are publicly available also in the chat, such as the first um, protection analysis update you mentioned that was released uh, last year and others and uh, I'm sure colleagues uh, from the information uh, management working group who are with us today can also further support other uh, operations who would be inspired uh, by that. So thank you so much Katrin. Colleagues uh, you can start posting your questions comments in the chat we will get uh, to them. And uh, let me now invite colleagues from Syria, please, to come in. Uh, we will uh, start uh, with Samir. Uh, Samir Saran, who is the Protection Cluster Colleague for Whole of Syria Response. And uh, we are looking forward to hearing the example from the Whole of Syria from you. Over to you, Samir. Thank you, Valerie and colleagues. And uh, I was just listening to Katrin, and uh, it was very interesting for me as well. And uh, Katrin really covered a lot of uh, lot of ground. <laughs> so uh, before I talk about examples, uh, I just want to emphasize that the kind of opportunities for clusters and coordinators for engaging with human rights uh, issues and actors and human rights mechanisms can be in different forms. So they can be bilateral, collective, institutional level and uh, systematic engagement as opposed to ad hoc and uh, case by case engagement. Now how these are used by us or uh, by you uh, depends on factors such as the individuals on the ground, the institutional priorities and the overall tone often that we see from the humanitarian sector leadership. And since it relies, relies on many of these factors, often the engagement is most difficult or, or strained in contexts that require it the most. In, uh, in my examples, I'll try to focus more on the efforts today rather than the challenges to hopefully illustrate uh, in addition to what Katrin mentioned as to how it's still possible, even if in a limited manner, to have this engagement even in the more constrained context. So the current context where I work, the Syria humanitarian response, as we know, is heavily influenced by human rights violations and an environment that places a lot of pressure on this engagement between humanitarian and human rights actors. So some of the ways in which this engagement has worked have been primarily at bilateral level. The UN Commission of Inquiry on Syria is a key human rights entity in our context. And, and over the years, several coordinators and I have had frequent sustained bilateral engagement with them. And these have been through in-person meetings during the, during the Commission of Inquiry's visit to Amman and also through various calls on other occasions. In addition to that, we've helped facilitate safe bilateral contact between them and strategic humanitarian actors to support their work. And in return, we have had the opportunity to use their reports and information to reflect into our own work and analysis at times. 
We and GBV partners specifically also receive case referrals from Commission of Inquiry for GBV, uh, GBV related assistance. Uh, and these are cases that they come into contact with in, in relation to information that people are providing, providing to them. GBV colleagues specifically engage with aspects of sexual and reproductive health rights, such as access to sexual reproductive health services, bodily autonomy, and addressing reproductive coercion as linked to gender-based violence within the human rights framework. In these, they also engage with OHCHR as an entity. Another example that I can, I can put forward about this is the annual report of the UN Secretary General on conflict related sexual violence. And towards this, the, G the GBV AOR leads on inputs from, from Syria. And these are often things that we are unable to mention in our HPC products, but through this engagement, we are able to put forward this information to be used in, in the right way for advocacy and further action. UNICEF and child protection actors as we heard earlier from Katrin as well, are key in collecting and verifying information of the different kinds of child rights violations within the framework of human rights under MRM or the monitoring and reporting mechanisms of grave child rights violations. And then they also lead in providing response to, to people who are survivors of these violations. Now, some of the major human rights NGOs, such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, have produced many reports or targeted advocacy on issues relevant to Syria. So, for example, there was a report on conditions in Al Hol, which is the biggest camp for displaced people in Syria, or about foreign fighters and their families languishing in detention across Syria, or risks of losing cross border humanitarian assistance, and other reports. For these and other advocacy opportunities, some of us coordinators and uh, sector partners have had periodic bilateral contact with them to feed in the information and perspective which we have due to our presence either on the ground or within the humanitarian response. And this helps us as humanitarian actors to then sometimes call out what needs to be called out in the words that it needs to be called out or reach audiences that are not traditionally accessible to us but are accessible to these partners. An additional benefit for us as the sector of this engagement is that it expands our information sources and enriches our analysis of protection issues. Because as humanitarian actors, we are usually confined to thinking through the lens of quantitative data, but by applying the human rights lens and engaging with human rights actors, we are also able to incorporate the qualitative analysis that is crucial to underpin a lot of the protection response we provide and also prioritize our interventions more strategically towards the long-term mitigation of protection needs. Throughout last year, I also had the opportunity to closely liaise with the Human Rights Engagement Task Team and benefit from some of the tools that they've created that can provide guidance to our efforts on incorporating human rights into protection work and thinking of engaging with human rights mechanisms. So going forward, uh, the protection sector at whole of Syria level is currently in conversation with the human rights engagement task team to develop further practical steps, which we will then take uh, to increase this engagement in 2022, especially into our HNO and HRP narratives and in guiding the leadership in Syria response. As a sector, we are also trying to strengthen our engagement which, with the OSCHR human rights advisors to the three humanitarian coordinators that we have in Syria. And one example of this is our joint work in creating an advocacy plan for the leadership. Uh, my colleague Elsa will elaborate more on our collaboration on some of these issues, but I just want to end by saying that even if we often may not see direct results of engaging with human rights issues and actors, there is value in the efforts we make since at minimum the awareness that we create through this helps to hold us and our leadership accountable in our humanitarian activities. So let me in there and hand it back to you, Valerie, and I hope I've not exceeded my time. Thank you so much, Samir, for sharing this experience from whole of Syria, such a complex uh, situation and how you still manage uh, to reach out and use effectively and strategically the human rights systems 
being smart about it, oftentimes on confidential basis, as you mentioned. Uh, so not necessarily to be there at the forefront, but use them uh, for the better protection. So this is uh, again very inspirational. And I also appreciate how you gave us examples uh, from other mm, subclusters, child protection, gender based uh, violence, and how you are bringing it together as a cluster as a whole. So um, a lot out there. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions coming, but as you mentioned, you have initiated and to strengthen over the years the collaboration with human rights advisors as well. And a testimony uh, to that is the fact that we have it with us today, Elsa, who is the human rights advisors uh, for uh, whole of Syria. So we would like to hear from you, Elsa, please. Thanks very much, uh, Valerie, and thanks to you and the and the Global Protection Cluster for this new initiative um, and for this enthusiasm indeed and on, on the engagement with the OHCHR and and uh, and particularly since last year with uh, with us uh, HRAs because I'm not the only human rights advisor. We are actually two human rights advisors and my colleague Abdelaziz Abdelaziz is also online. So just note that for the question and answers because he's um, just to say a word to start on the context in which we operate. Uh, we, uh, as Samir mentioned, we operate in what we call the whole of Syria structure, which um, unlike in other operation has three humanitarian uh, coordinators with the one based in Damascus, who is the resident coordinator, humanitarian coordinator, and uh, my colleague Aziz is advising him. And I'm advising the two other humanitarian coordinators based uh, in Amman and Gaziantep. Uh, but really just to say that it's it's good to deep dive into uh, our experience and best practices uh, through this different webinar since last year. So well done on, on bringing uh, field protection cluster coordinators and OHHR colleagues together again to discuss this and particularly on the on the call to action, which is really, really important. So uh, I'll try to be short to be brief. Uh, next slide, please. I just give you uh, say a few words on on the sort of uh, unique context in which we um, HRAs and OHHR and the protection sector are operating in this uh, in this bizarre whole of theory response um, to say that which HR is part of the UN response um, to the Syria crisis since 2011, despite not being in the country, as uh, the government of Syria has not granted which HR any in-country pre presence, um, despite repeated requests. Um, so our office has four main components, which are the, the, the uh, three of them being the traditional um, human rights uh, components uh, in, in any country offices, office, sorry. Um, so first, of course, the monitoring and reporting. We have one um, rule of law and accountability unit and one uh, civil society and technical cooperation. And in addition to those three units, we have since 2015, um, what we call the Human Rights in Humanitarian Action uh, Project, which is this deployment of, of initially three, but now we are two human rights advisors um, in the in the in the response. So important to say here that human rights advisors are part of a, a larger uh, OHCHR package, uh, which includes this monitoring and reporting. Uh, carried out from Beirut remotely, uh, as well as the advocacy and the legal tools that we produce uh, with our legal advisor uh, and, and our colleagues, uh, in addition to the to the provision of, of this easy access to human uh, human rights mechanisms, UN human rights mechanisms and the political support through the High Commissioner Public uh, Advocacy on, on IHL and, and human rights. And I'm just saying this because that's quite an innovative and unique model of embedding human rights advisors in the humanitarian operation, uh, which initially responded to a widely identified gap uh, back in, in 2015. So I won't expand much on, on this, but, but just to say that the need for 
such HRAs uh, was backed uh, by the findings of a, a comprehensive and much discussed uh, whole of system review of protection in the context of humanitarian action back in, in May 2015. That review was led by Nora Nieland. Um, the, the, the method of work of human rights advisors uh, very briefly uh, or, or quite uh, include of course, first, the provision of technical advice and support on IHL uh, and human rights uh, to the humanitarian leadership and, and humanitarian partners. The integration of human rights and international standards and analysis in the HPC, in the humanitarian program, as well as the, the F, I mean, all the efforts to, to build the capacity of humanitarian actors on IHL and human rights. Um, but here it's important to say that really all the work we do as HRAs is based on a thorough understanding of the IHL and human rights development on the ground, which is made possible through this systematic, uh, remote, but systematic and extent uh, extensive monitoring effort uh, from Beirut. And here, related to the call to action, it's important to end to, end to the humanitarian program cycle to say that OHCHR largely contributes to the intersector protection of civilians chapter of, of the HNO um, with UNICEF MRM, um, which regularly, I mean annually, uh, provide this, uh, this uh, reports and thorough documentation and, and civilian uh, tracking system um, data. Uh, I'll just say just two more things before I go into the best practices and, and really I, I try to stick to two examples uh, just to, to be brief. But just to say that that the the sort of um, uh, internal stock stock taking exercises that we OHCHR Syria have conducted since 2015 have led to a number of, of lessons learned and, and recommendation to take forward, which really shows how the human rights advisors to the humanitarian coordinators are complementary to existing interagency resources and do not overlap with pre-existing advocacy support to the RC and HC. Uh, for example, of course, the protection cluster coordinators uh, or the humanitarian protection um, lead agency. And the, the work of the protection cluster coordinators and UNHCR as the lead agency on protection is not duplicated by the contribution of HRAs. Uh, it's just a room for close partnership between, between protection cluster coordinators, UNHCR uh, and OHCHR. Next slide, please. And here I'll just uh, uh, probably say a few words about the two first examples. Otherwise, I'm sure we'll have time in the question and answers to go in, into the others. But in terms of the good practices and the collaboration between humanitarian and human rights actors in Syria, I will focus say a few words on, on two examples. First is the work we've done with the protection cluster and the health uh, sector on attacks on healthcare in Syria. Um, and the second is uh, about the engagement that we as an office and, and human rights advisors had with Syrian humanitarian and human rights NGOs, as well as with the Commission of Inquiry, with the IIIM and other bodies uh, in the framework of uh, the Human Rights Reference Group, the HRRG, which was created in uh, Gaziantep back in um, Gaziantep being one of the hubs in the whole of Syria, in Turkey, um, created back in 2015. Um, and, and I'm f just flagging those two examples to show how this engagement between humanitarian and human rights actors have both contributed to an improved quality of the of the outputs and the processes throughout the, the HPC um, to produce a, a more robust uh, protection analysis, including gender analysis, grounded on IHL and, and human rights. And that was really the first reason why we had decided uh, to create that. So I'll just start very briefly on, on the on the issue of attacks on healthcare, uh, um, just to say that obviously the situation of uh, attacks on, on medical units in Syria since 2016 and, and, and clearly after the, the involvement of, of uh, Russia in, 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 in Syria with a, a systematic uh, 
uh, attacks on, on medical units really prompted the production cluster, the health cluster um, and human rights and the human rights office to work on the monitoring, reporting and advocacy on, on the issue to stop attacks on, on medical units. So we started engaging with the special rapporteur on the right to health, um, Dr. Puras at that time, that was in 2016. We had a number of public statements in which both humanitarian and, and human rights actors contributed uh, in terms of data, in terms of analysis. Then this led to uh, an awareness building and advo an advocacy mission to Geneva that was supported by the Global Protection Cluster back in 2016. And then we finally organized a roundtable uh, discussion on attacks, also on mental health and on sexual and reproductive health uh, back in Gaziantep. Just all this to say that that really uh, provided the, 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 the basis for some high level uh, advocacy uh, that was also supported uh, on the occasion of the ECOSOC humanitarian affairs segment in Geneva back in 2016. And it was really a good example of how uh, we could bring together Syrian NGOs and international NGOs like PHR, SAMS and, and others uh, um, to really improve the the the, the analysis uh, on, on, on IHL and, and human rights violations. So this is really ongoing. We are now engaging with the new special rapporteur, um, Dr. Mofo Kang from South Africa on, on this issue, very much working with UNFPA and the GBV subcluster and others. Just a few words, I'll really try to, to be brief, but on the human rights um, reference group uh, that was created in, in Gaziantep, I can actually share the link uh, in the chat box after that. There was a piece uh, published on, on the Global Protection Cluster website with ODI, the paper on collaborative uh, advocacy between humanity and human rights actors. There's a, a page on, on the Human Rights Reference Group, uh, so you will have more, but just also to say that this was created really uh, at the request of Syrian NGOs, um, human rights and humanitarian NGOs, to improve not only the exchange on, on, on of information on IHL and human rights development, but also to suggest a number of way forwards in terms of advocacy and how we could really encourage the humanitarian leadership um, in Gaziantep and, um, and the rest uh, to scale up the advocacy uh, on IHL, which was at that time not the case. So there's this has provided a, a more comprehensive analysis of protection of the protection situation um, that has also resulted in more information exchange and that really has enabled this group to serve as a, a platform for coordinating the strategic advocacy on, on key protection issues. Um, I wanted to say something on, on, on the work we're doing indeed with UNFP and the GBV subcluster on, on sexual and reproductive health as Samir has mentioned, but I'm just going to stop here by concluding on, on one thing that uh, is important in terms of the, the call to action. Um, the We have offered recently to brief the SSG, the SSG being the equivalent of the HCT in Syria, so it's the co-chaired by the two um, humanitarian coordinators, Aman and, and Damascus, and OHHR has uh, offered to brief uh, the SSG on the call to action and the agenda for protection. So that really relates to what uh, Sweda and, and other colleagues uh, said about this country level engagement on the action on the call to action. So we very much look forward to um, keep you all posted on how this goes at the country level um, and how we can leverage the call to action at the country level, as, as Samir said, also by by supporting this protection advocacy plan that we have worked on together. Sorry, we didn't have time to go into this, but I'll stop here. Sorry, I was a bit long. Thank you, Valerie. Over to you. Thank you so much, Elsa. There is uh, a lot of good practices, so um, um, thank you for sharing those. And when I 
listen to you, uh, as I, it always reminds me how little we are using the capacity uh, of human rights advisors in the field. And as protection clusters and humanitarian entities, we can definitely uh, strengthen our partnership with uh, human rights advisors. You mentioned different ways how we can do that, uh, including through capacity building that you can support with you uh, and many other examples. So it's also a reminder to all of us and our dear colleagues in the field that we have a strong potential partner out there, an ally. Uh, let us uh, use them. Uh, so thanks so much, Elsa, for giving us those concrete examples. Very good. So let us uh, now change the continent and thanks to colleagues who are putting questions in the chat. Um, we will hear from Juan Sebastian Diaz Perre, the Protection Cluster Coordinator in Colombia. Uh, Juan will uh, present in Spanish, but don't worry, we have Boris, uh, the lead of the information management uh, working group under the Global Protection Cluster, who will translate and uh, interpret for us uh, after each slide. So uh, uh, for those who are not fluent in Spanish, uh, you can still fully benefit. Um, Sebastian and also Hugo thereafter, I would maybe like uh, to ask you if you can also weave in uh, some aspects. I know you will already, but uh, reading the question that Alice posted in the chat, if you can give concrete examples how this collaboration with OHCHR works in practice uh, in terms of analysis, in terms of um, sharing information, advocacy, etc. Very good. I stop here and over to you, please, Sebastian. Estimado Sebastian, a usted. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, colleagues, for, for this opportunity. Eh, bueno, a hablar en español. Escúchenme, vamos a ser muy, muy concretos también en, en la presentación. Next, please. Eh, Bueno, yo creo que es fundamental plantearles a ustedes desde la experiencia de Colombia lo que ha sido para nosotros el análisis en el marco de PAF en, en función de un elemento concreto y ha sido Colombia es hoy una crisis de protección de, de, de múltiples variantes. Tenemos situaciones asociadas a desplazamiento forzado interno de carácter prolongado. Tenemos situaciones de... <coughs> impactos desproporcionales sobre comunidades indígenas, afrocolombianas y campesinas. Tenemos al mismo tiempo territorios en riesgo, tenemos comunidades que viven bajo la emergencia recurrente de un desplazamiento forzado y un retorno no acompañado y comunidades que dependen de las soluciones. Tal confluencia de problemas y de dificultades genera para nosotros la necesidad de una priorización por área y quisiera insistir en este elemento. Para nosotros es fundamental hoy, en términos del análisis del link en función de derechos humanos, hacer un enfoque de área. Colombia no se puede entender toda de la misma manera. Tenemos situaciones particulares en territorios particulares y por lo mismo es muy importante este mapa que les presentamos que ha sido el resultado del HNO para nosotros este año y es identificar territorios que están en severidades grado 5, la costa pacífica del país, la frontera con Venezuela y algunos otros departamentos en donde viven comunidades de especial protección constitucional, ya mencionadas, comunidades indígenas, afrocolombianas, campesinas o comunidades que se han desplazado en múltiples ocasiones que viven en las periferias urbanas de grandes ciudades. Por lo mismo, el primer elemento como experiencia aprendida y creemos exitosa, eh, avanzar desde un enfoque de área geográfica para interpretar desde allí las necesidades de protección. Thank you so much, uh, Sebastián, and I will try to, to do it as well as you did. But, um, uh, which is uh, almost uh, something impossible, no? But uh, uh, Sebastián was mentioning you that one of the key aspects of the implementation of the protection analytical framework in Colombia is about the multi-dimension, multi-reality of the different contexts of, uh, of the country and the need of making an area or a regional uh, analysis of the process. You cannot compare the situation in the uh, so-called highland, highlands to another areas like the coast of the Pacific, etc., to uh, considering the different realities, particularly because Colombia 
Australia in terms of protection and linkage with the uh, with human rights is facing up that multi-dimensional which is characterized by the displacement uh, but also the, the impact on indigenous afro-descendant uh, uh, farmers etc that they are uh, facing in several in several levels the the impact of the of the conflict and another risk the presence of refugees and migrant uh, population mixed movements uh, towards the united states and extreme natural disasters but one of the things that uh, sebastian was highlighting it was the need that in order to have a proper protection analysis that includes the human rights uh, lenses and the human rights perspective into the overall analysis is to have a focus at geographical area, a focus that later on can have a direct and positive impact in how the coordination with the stakeholders uh, and partners, but also the coordination and the planning of the response can take place in an appropriate manner. Uh, Sebastián, te paso la palabra. Gracias, Boris. Next, please. Ese, ese enfoque de derechos humanos para nosotros en el actual contexto resulta clave y fundamental por, por un elemento, como el análisis del conductor de la crisis en vulneración de derechos humanos nos activa a nosotros un tipo de respuesta específica y un marco normativo de respuesta en Colombia específico. Ya mencionamos, Colombia es hoy un escenario en el que persiste el desplazamiento forzado interno, pero al cual han venido llegando poblaciones refugiadas y migrantes provenientes de Venezuela, que hoy, adicional a esa huida y esa situación de protección internacional, requieren una respuesta en el marco interno, dado que están siendo víctimas estas poblaciones de desplazamientos forzados internos, desapariciones, amenazas. Eh, que, que pues ponen en riesgo eh, el marco de derechos humanos, vida, libertad y seguridad eh, expresamente. Entonces, para nosotros, dada también la complejidad que tenemos en Colombia, para referencia de ustedes, existe la estructura tradicional del clúster de protección, pero existe en Colombia también una estructura que es de respuesta para la población venezolana. En esa lógica estamos trabajando cada vez más juntos, cada vez más unidos en entender los conductores de crisis, eh, para estas poblaciones y entender cómo debería ser la respuesta institucional. Yo creo que Colombia tiene una experiencia muy alta en materia de atención al desplazamiento forzado interno. No es gratuito estos 20 años de desarrollos en marco normativo. No obstante, persiste en Colombia un estado de cosas inconstitucional declarado por la Corte Constitucional y en esa lógica es necesario mantener los esquemas de monitoreo de la situación interna en función de ese enfoque de derechos humanos. No podríamos perder el norte, dado que el enfoque de derechos humanos nos genera el marco de referencia sobre el cual deberíamos estar activando nuestras respuestas. Gracias, Sebastián. Uh, and, and I will pick one sentence that you say in Spanish uh, for having a wonderful overview about what it means protection and human rights. Now you were mentioning about vida, libertad, and seguridad, which uh, translated it means life, freedom, and security. Uh, what uh, what Sebastián was uh, mentioning is the, the different realities and the different legal frameworks that uh, that also they, uh, they make impact in the way that we are coordinating the uh, two different responses that we have in the country. From one side, we have the internal uh, armed conflict that is last for uh, many years, but it has a national, a national legislation and a, na a national approach in terms of how to approach the, the national protection uh, services and also how to have to have access to, to legal support by the, by the state. And then what we have is all the current situation uh, regarding the Venezuelan uh, migration. And, uh, and you will see what he was uh, defining, the, what uh, he's uh, showing in the, in the slide, are uh, the different risks that uh, both uh, population groups they are facing at the moment. No? So from the left side of the internal conflict, we have the violence, uh, threats to retaliation, uh, recruitment, confinement, the typical ones, the, the regretfully typical ones that the Colombian population is facing for so many years already. And then what we have is the, the situation of the, uh, the Venezuelan migrants, like uh, facing the regular, regularization of the mig mig migratory status, sorry for that, the trafficking and smuggling of uh, migrants, uh, protection risk during the migrants route for us uh, accessing to the Colombian territory gender-based violence and uh, the protection of migrants and refugee children. Over to you, uh, Sebastián. Adelante. Gracias, Boris. And, and the last slide, please. Uh, Repeat, please, uh, last slide. Next slide, thank you. 
Eh, bueno, ¿y, y, y cómo, cómo incluimos el análisis eh, del Protection Analysis Framework en, en nuestro trabajo? Yo creo, lo, lo primero es resaltar el hecho de que la construcción de estos análisis no los hacemos desde el nivel nacional. Los hacen mis colegas en los equipos subnacionales del clúster de protección y a ellos todo el, el respeto por el conocimiento del contexto que tienen y por el relacionamiento que tienen, no solo con socios del clúster de protección tradicionales, agencias del sistema y organizaciones internacionales, sino también eh, organizaciones y estructuras nacionales y locales de derechos humanos. Y en eso quiero relevar la experiencia de las personerías, que son una especie de defensorías del pueblo eh, en los territorios y la misma Defensoría del Pueblo. El intercambio permanente entre los miembros de los equipos subnacionales con esas autoridades de derechos humanos nos permiten un monitoreo del contexto con múltiples variables, pero también nos permiten mantener la confianza en un escenario que es hoy tan inestable y tan complejo en materia de acceso a los territorios. Por lo mismo, ese análisis basado en contexto riesgos, capacidades y recomendaciones resulta rico en función de la experiencia local, no necesariamente de la reflexión nacional. Evidentemente nosotros en el nivel nacional complementamos algunos elementos, pero es fundamental para nosotros la experiencia local. Nosotros eh, con el apoyo de GPC logramos publicar eh, en diciembre del año pasado dos eh, Protection Analysis Updates para Norte de Santander, frontera con Venezuela y para el departamento del Chocó, con particularidades específicas. El Chocó con ese enfoque étnico, ese, ese llamado de atención que queremos hacer sobre la desproporcionalidad de los efectos del desplazamiento forzado interno y el confinamiento sobre comunidades afro e indígenas y en Norte de Santander esa mixtura de emergencias que está viviendo hoy este territorio de frontera. Pero quisiéramos relevar ese hecho de cómo nuestros socios y pues, las redes locales que se tejen en los territorios terminan generando los análisis de contextos más eh, pertinentes para cada coyuntura y cada territorio. Gracias, Sebastián. In uh, his uh, last slide, uh, uh, Sebastián was giving you an overview of the analysis, the, the analysis updates that uh, our, they have been, the national uh, team, they have been uh, producing uh, late last year and insisting on something that this is uh, the analysis process is not a national level. It shouldn't be something that happens at national coordination level, but it has to happen at subnational level, where the reality, uh, the reality, the knowledge, the access and also the interaction when we talk about the human rights uh, networks, etc., I will give you one specific example, is critical. In in order to incorporate it into the, the analysis. So more, more than anything else, uh, Sebastian was highlighting about the importance to bring the analysis closer to the frontline uh, interventions and operations and to ensure in this way that we can make a proper analysis in terms of context, risk, uh, capabilities and recommendations. For sure, later on at national level, there is the articulation with more strategic analysis where the linkages with the humanitarian needs overview, etc. But again, the, uh, the question of the, uh, this subnational or area-based approach. Particularly, he was highlighting the uh, how useful it was this approach at subnational level for working with the personerias, which is a, a specific pro, uh, institution uh, for Colombia at local level. It's a local ombudsman the intera and the interaction of our subnational teams with these uh, local personerias. It has really ensured and facilitated first because of the level of trust, the level of interaction and daily interaction, but also to, to bring uh, into our analysis all the the risk, but also the, the overall human rights analysis incorporated in the overall protection, protection analysis. With this, I will finish, but yes, uh, muchas gracias de nuevo, Sebastián, por tu participación. Aquí estamos. Muchísimas gracias, Sebastián, y gracias a Boris también. Thank you so much for this uh, very concrete and interesting presentation from Colombia Context, which I believe responded a lot to Ali's uh, question, how it works in practice and the bottom-up approach, the area approach, the relationship with the local institution. So uh, thank you so much, um, Sebastián, if possible to put in the chat the link to your protection analysis update that you already produced, I'm sure colleagues would appreciate, and it also corresponds to Pedro's question in the chat, who is asking about more examples about uh, the data that we collect and how we share them. And I am sure, uh, Boris, uh, maybe you can also uh, post in the chat some examples uh, to respond to Pedro's question and then uh, add some elements after we hear from Hugo.
And the, uh, to mention that Abdima had also uh, asked a question in the chat about a very specific uh, topic, child recruitment in Colombia. I would invite all colleagues uh, to take this opportunity of uh, our today's webinar to also connect bilaterally. So Abdi Mahat, please feel free to reach out to Sebastian. Sebastian, please, if you can put your contact details also in the chat, but it's valid for all of you. If you feel inspired by some of the in examples or would like to know more, please do reach out to the panelists and uh, dear panelists, please put your uh, contacts in the chat um, so that they are available. Very good. Um, I also note the question from Shaista. Shaista has been um, interested in the intersectional analysis. So it also links to the opening that Dina gave us at the beginning of our today's webinar. And I'm wondering, Elsa, if there is a way to share uh, the link you mentioned uh, before, so uh, um, the way you worked with health cluster, uh, GBV colleagues on the intersectoral analysis and the advocacy it resulted uh, to, I believe this would be very interesting example for Shaista and other colleagues. And uh, uh, please feel free to add any other elements also in the chat before we come back to you. But let us now move to our last panelist, but definitely not least, Hugo, uh, who will give us the perspective uh, from Mozambique. So over to you, Hugo, please. Thank you very much, Valerie. Um, so I take very much into account the questions of Alice and also the reflection of Dina in the beginning of this event, you know, on how can we be more intentional in our processes. And I have a very small uh, presentation. Um, as mentioned by Catherine, I will not go into the context, but just to say that um, what I've been always reminding the ACT and also the ICCG here in Mozambique is that um, cyclones don't commit human rights violations, right? Because we have a cluster system here that was born from the Idai cyclone in 2019. And this is the cluster system that has maintained itself and it has been responding to the, the increased displacement in northern Mozambique since 2020 as a result of conflict and human rights violations. These are non-state armed groups, as the media calls them terrorists, who are um, in conflict with the, the Mozambican military and who are displacing these large amounts of, uh, of IDPs, of course, so through a series of human rights violations, human rights being very much at the center of this emergency. Um, so on that note, um, some very practical example of what we've been starting this year and actually continuing from last year on how to include um, human rights in our humanitarian processes. Um, one is that uh, last year we've launched a strategic advisory group. This is, of course, a best practice of protection clusters around the world and the recommendation of the GPC. Um, within this context of Mozambique, where protection is very much a novelty and a humanitarian response, right? But human rights isn't. Everybody understands the language of human rights, human rights integration into development programs that have been active in this country for decades. Um, we saw as very important to have OACHR colleague in our strategic advisory group. As you know, these are 12 um, very um, strategic handpicked members, right, who form part of this steering committee of the, of the cluster. And this is the forum where, where we turn to for strategic discussions, strategic directions, and also analysis um, of the context. Um, for your information, any reports, any any ad advisory, any position paper that we produced, go through the 12 members of the strategic advisory group um, and we make sure that there's a consensus that they have seen, they provide their edits. This is why um, OACHR is there to bring in that human rights uh, lens. Um, another thing that we've started last year and um, we are continuing this year is to have a very strong engagement with the National Human Rights Commission of Mozambique. 
This is a commission that is very much embedded, of course, within the government structures of the country. There's a representative of both parties um, within the, the National Assembly. There are representatives from the Lawyers uh, Forum of Mozambique. Um, there's a number of very high level um, individuals. So we have we have been partnering with them since last year, providing briefing on durable solutions. This is a big keyword here in Mozambique at the moment, because as you know, there are troops stationed in the north and the government has been overly optimistic, inviting IDPs to return in areas previously controlled by non-state armed groups. However, what we've seen, unfortunately, December and even over um, the last few weeks of January has been the abduction, the killing of many of these IDPs who have returned. Um, linked to this is, of course, the participation of the National Human Rights Commission in our protection cluster meetings. Um, the National Protection Cluster meetings in Mozambique have been converted to more or less a forum of exchange of information. So we have the National Human Rights Commission participating. We have a number of human rights advocates working in the country. We have also, for example, um, donors participating. So we've turned it more into a forum because we have three um, sub uh, regional clusters. We have the protection cluster in Cabo Delgado. We have a, two other protection working groups and they are dealing mostly with the with the micro um, coordination of the response. However, at the national level, um, our, our, our meeting is more a forum for briefing of analysis. And of course, with the National Human Rights Commission participating, they can get that in first hand. Um, as mentioned, the Strategic Advisory Group is the forum where we turn for technical advice. So all of the protection monitoring tools that we are um, preparing before missions. Um, we are also working on a protection incident monitoring system that some year might remember for Myanmar, um, for Mozambique, but that's still very at its embryonic stage. But we discuss these within the strategic advisory group and we make sure that OACHR not only looks at these tools, but also provides uh, inputs. Um, so a lot of the, the reports that we've been producing um, automatically um, collects information on human rights violations. We also have a partnership in 2022 with OACHR. Um, thanks to ECHO funding, if they are connected, we are very grateful. Um, this has allowed us to partner um, um, through UNHCR, having a colleague funded through UNHCR with ECHO funding based in the field. Uh, the colleague will be working very closely to my counterpart in Cabo Delgado and uh, mainstreaming, of course, uh, human rights in the work, but also supporting us in that endeavor of scaling up protection monitoring and putting into place this protection incident monitoring system that we really hope will get off paper and on the ground in early 2022. Some of the things that we've been doing, of course, is including human rights language throughout the HRPHNO, but also in our protection cluster strategy that has its own small uh, chapter on human rights. And you'll see a draft of that, Valerie, at some point, if you don't leave us too soon. Um, we are also working on a, on a, on a strategic advocacy, um, a, protection, uh, an a, a strategy for protection advocacy. Um, and with that strat on that strategy, we're working very closely with the PROCAP and OACHR. Why the PROCAP? Because the PROCAP is part of the RCOs team. I go back to what Sveta was saying, the challenge of getting HCTs and RCHCs of understanding uh, the issue of human rights. So what we've done is that we, we've, we have also members of the RCO and our strategic advisory group and the OSHR colleagues, so they can, you know, be imbued of our human rights analysis. And this can be then, of course, uh, communicated across um, and into the HCT. We are planning joint missions with the National Human Rights Commission together with that OSHR colleague in 2022. Um, and what I've said before in this forum in a different event was 2021 was actually a, a year for great uh, opportunities for us, 
because Mozambique went through the Universal Periodic Review um, within the Human Rights Council. So we gathered a handful of willing embassies who are also sitting in the Human Rights Council and briefed them on four main points that we wanted them to get across. Um, and these were reflected then in the recommendations at the Human Rights Council floor. We also um, prepared a, a confidential, well, not so confidential now that I'm mentioning it, but a confidential note to the ICCPR review of Mozambique um, to the panel experts. Um, with some, again, with some topics that we gathered from this forum, right, which is the protection cluster, right? We have 30 plus members, NGOs, national NGOs, UNs, some working in the field, some working at the strategic level on advocacy. So it's really an ideal forum for gathering those issues and transmitting those onward for these uh, human rights opportunities, such as the UPR and um, treaty body reviews. And that's it really. Of course, the HNO HRP has been uh, reviewed by the OACHR colleague within our SAG um, and our strategy as well. Um, and that's it from my side. Over back to you, Valerie. Thank you so much, Hugo. And I think you have really completed the very comprehensive uh, overview of examples that have been given on uh, how the engagement with human rights actors and on human rights issues complements the protection analysis efforts and feeds into the HPC related processes. And uh, uh, you have gone even a step farther in Mozambique where you have then used this analysis information that has been uh, done collectively for advocacy and uh, um, getting uh, use of the human rights mechanism. So thank you for sharing that with us as well. It's definitely the next level as well and uh, a very, very effective. Uh, your relationship with OHCHR is also quite special and very, uh, very concrete. And again, going back to Ali's question, I think it provides a lot of uh, uh, elements. Very good colleagues, we are uh, at the end of our event uh, uh, nearly. I think we replied to all of your comments and questions in the chat. Uh, there was a question from Julian um, or Julian uh, Watkinson that I found very interesting, which is related uh, to how uh, we can bring visibility to the invisible or non-quantifiable humanitarian impacts of uh, living under the control of armed groups and uh, linked to the advocacy efforts. Uh, are there joint advocacy frameworks in place in other countries? What we could learn? And Julian, uh, with uh, the permission of the task team colleagues and uh, uh, I am working group lead and uh, other uh, um, colleagues who are preparing those webinars, I would actually suggest that we take this um, as a possible topic for our next webinar on how we can leverage the call to action for this type of situation. Uh, looking at Sweta as well and our advocacy task team uh, colleagues who are with us, Carolina, Mary Emily and Alison. Uh, so we will take it forward and hopefully have a dedicated discussion on this uh, going uh, forward. Colleagues, uh, my dear panelists, uh, we have limited time, but I'm going back to you. Has the discussion sparkled uh, any further inputs in, you would like to share in one minute? Uh, some key messages also taking into consideration Senai's question, which is now in the chat. Uh, Sveta, can I turn towards you, please? Yeah, thanks so much for this excellent discussion and the really amazing uh, and super inspiring examples actually from the field. I was thinking that it'd be great to kind of find a way of linking um, these examples up to the work that is being done at headquarters because I think that our interagency working group is also thinking about different ways in which to engage and I think the very practical ways that you've pointed out uh, would be um, of great value and interest to them as well. So perhaps that's something we could set up um, like a, a mutual exchange or a briefing or something like that. Just to briefly touch on some of the points that Senai had raised, I think 
those are really interesting, especially the first one um, that you mentioned, Sinai. So one of the um, things that we've been trying to do is to have like systematic briefings and discussions between the two system leads uh, for the call to action. So that's USG for Kultur and ASG Ilse Branskiris, who's um, OHCHR with SRSGs, with SEs, so the special envoys, um, and with RCHCs to really kind of open up, I think, the space for consideration, because one of the things that we're noticing, of course, is that a number of the SRSGs even say, well, oh, human rights, that doesn't really relate to my work or my mandate or whatever. So it's sort of kind of opening up that box um, in, a, in an intimate conversation, actually, with those two uh, senior leaders, and then working out well, where is it that there are the, where is it that specific training in a way would be necessary, and where is it that particular uh, discussions still need to happen that then kind of have to trickle down to uh, their technical staff and and sort of country level engagements. I think in terms of training more broadly, what we're thinking about is, I mean, Valerie has been uh, intimately involved in kind of mapping out human rights related training that are that is available already across the system and then making sure that people are aware of these various courses that exist and making sure that that just becomes part of a standard way of engaging. So one of the things that we're also looking at is sort of um, reviewing leadership compacts and then finding ways in which to insert human rights almost as like an obligation so that there's a very clear priority that is set right from the way um, your individual um, engagement is assessed through to where it features in, in your programming. Thank you so much, Sveta. You have managed to respond uh, to Senai's questions, and I, I hope this was satisfactory and there is a lot of follow up we will be doing. Again, I think it would be worth actually to have a dedicated session, maybe on the available capacity building supports and materials and uh, what is out there, what colleagues can use in which language. Uh, so Senai um, and colleagues, if you uh, find it uh, useful, uh, please tell us and we can organize that. That, um, happily so. Um, there is a reminder, please, for all panelists to share the contacts in the chat, uh, if you can. Um, that would be much appreciated. So I think this has been very fruitful. Uh, we have heard a lot of examples from the field, and I believe we have a better understanding, all of us, how all this links to the call to action, what it means in practice. We have also two suggestions for future topics of our engagement. Uh, you have seen also Boris' message in the chat that he is fully available on behalf of the uh, Information Management Working Group to support you uh, specifically on the analysis, protection analysis updates. Uh, Boris, so I take the liberty to uh, repeat again that uh, uh, the resources are here to support you in the field. Please do reach out to the IM Working Group, to the Human Rights Engagement Task Team, Advocacy Task Team under the Global Protection cluster and others. This is the first um, um, webinar in a series and we you can uh, you will be hearing from us more. I see Boris, so uh, please uh, take the floor over to you. No, no, I, I just to thank you, uh, thanking you, Valerie, for the wonderful uh, comments that you have. Yes, sir. Uh, just to tell that, yes, uh, as Valerie was mentioning this year, uh, we are aiming at our objective as a pillar is to roll out the path, including also the analysis on human rights. We have a specific work stream, uh, as Valerie was mentioning, which is the share between the DISTAS team and the, the information analysis working group. And anyone that wants to initiate a protection analysis update uh, process, we will be reaching in you uh, very shortly, but at the same time, don't need to wait and come back to us and we'll initiate the process anytime. But thank you so much, and I don't want to steal you more time. I appreciate it, Valerie. Thank you so much, Boris, for all your support you are giving to the field. And colleagues, don't hesitate to reach out really and take advantage of this support and available resources. So let me conclude. Um, uh, this is just the beginning, or actually we have already started, but you can also uh, look forward next week to a communication coming from the Global Protection Cluster Coordinator from William Shemani, who will be, as uh, some of you know, already sharing a um, letter or a communication on 
how it is important, why it is important for field protection cluster to engage with human rights systems and uh, the key lines that are expected from all of us uh, to uh, to follow and to deliver on. So this is coming your way and we look forward to unpacking it with you even more going forward. Um, making sure that we contribute to the implementation of the call to action on human rights and moving the system forward collectively. So thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, we will be sharing recordings and the presentations and summary notes uh, in the upcoming few days with all of you and have a good rest of the day. Bye. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.